Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, welcome to this week's Griscom stream. Uh, thank you for being a little patient, uh, catching up on uh, getting all this stuff ready to go. Um, well, hope you all are good wherever you are at. Um, pretty excited for this today. Let me just pull this. There we go. Um, I hope you're good wherever you're at. Uh, we have a really fun uh, show tomorrow, uh, Wednesday at 7 Central with the Bronco, Branco Amar Kedic. Um, who is a writer at Jackman, also the author of Yesterday's Man, uh, a book about Joe Biden. Um, he's going to be joining us to sort of break down, um, you know, what it's looking like a year into the Biden administration. I'm sure you all know how we're feeling about it. Um, sorry, it just... Tech is just such a nightmare. Um, yeah, well, you know, I'm sure you all know how we feel about Biden in general, but it'll be fun to talk to somebody who's been sort of uh, covering him for a long time, um, has a kind of more holistic view of Joe Biden, sort of break down some of his history, um, along with what this most recent saga with cinema and mansion represents for Joe Biden. Are we out of ne neoliberalism, etc.? I'm really looking forward to that. So you can catch that tomorrow at Wednesday at 7. Um, Matt Leck will be there, of course. Um Let's see what we can do here. Um, but we got a few things to get to. I mean, I'm happy to take questions from the chat. Uh, welcome to everybody both on Twitch and on uh, YouTube. I think we're also on Facebook this time, but most people don't really hang out on Facebook too much anymore. Um, I'm looking forward to, to hearing from you all. Sorry about the, the camera shaking. I can't do anything about that live right now uh, just because... We're a little, uh, I'm a little behind right now and I only have a few minutes after this, I have to run because I'm doing some phone banking here in Austin, um, for a vote. No, on a prop a, uh, no way on prop a, which again, if you're in Austin, Texas, that you definitely need to make sure that you're showing up, uh, to vote no on prop a, I mean, it's a, just a ridiculous bill, um, that is going to pull back a lot of our abilities to do basic social services here in Austin, Texas, and it's just a big giveaway to the police union for no reason other than to benefit uh, the GOP. Uh, so definitely, if you're in Austin, Texas, try to get involved. We only have a couple more weeks before um, before the vote. Um, but let me see. I can start taking some questions. I have some kind of strike updates. All right. I see I'm shaking, so I'm sorry for the the slow start. Just give me one second. I'm, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just going to cut my camera for a moment so I can fix so it stops shaking for you all, all right? Damn. All right. That should be better. <laughs> I miss having the studio sometimes, y'all, very much. Um, but it's nicer to be here in Texas. All right, well, let me see. And we already got some people asking questions. Uh, on the chat. Um, <laughs> uh, we use a restream if someone's asking how we do the technical stuff here. We're trying to use uh, we're trying to use the birthday uh, the birthday week to get some people to show up for Patreon. I really want Matt Leck to come to Austin, Texas, and he won't do it until we hit 1,000 patrons. He's being a real stickler about that. Uh, I got the guest room ready for him. So we're 80 away, so if we can get folks showing up um, on, on our Patreon, that would mean a lot to both Matt and I. And that's why we're, we're pumping up the birthday shit. Um, but yeah, I, my birthday's on Sunday, so a little early now. Um, well, let's get some of these questions, and then we can get into some of this stuff. Um, Patrick Stevens says, a great talk from Kenzo about the perils of nuclear family and its capitalist tendencies, if you haven't heard it yet. I have not. Um, I haven't heard from Kenzo in a little bit. I hope that he is as well. I saw that he's off of social media, which is probably, um, you know, a good thing for, for mental health and all that. Um, but I, I saw some people were attacking him. I didn't see like the source of it, but I heard some people were attacking him, which I think is a complete joke. Kenzo is a real one um, and is somebody who nobody should be <laughs> getting mad at. Uh, he's somebody who not only talks to talk, but he walks to walk. Um, but thanks so much, Patrick, for the chat. Um, oh, yeah, we got a no question uh, from Super Nintendo over in Twitch. Uh, just keep it fantastic work and hook them horns. Yeah, uh, we're keeping it up, uh, <laughs> even though the two big losses to Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. All right, well, and we had a fun chat last week. I want to make sure that uh, 
we don't mess around too much this week. Um, Matt says, uh, thinking about applying for a death row public defense job down in Texas, question mark. I'm just trying to help out down there and hopefully abolish this death penalty. Well, of course, death penalty is absolutely barbaric and it needs to be abolished. And you can make arguments from that from a kind of left-wing social side to a libertarian side. I mean, the state just should not have that power over people at the end of the day. Uh, it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's truly, it's a, you know, it's a barbaric um, form of punishment, uh, one that it seems like there's been more and more uh, mobilization in other southern states to start pushing back on it. Texas is tough. Uh, Texas, unfortunately, probably be one of the last places to abolish it. So I don't know any material. I don't know too much about the the legal profession regarding public defense and uh, death row here. Um, but it's definitely an honorable honorable uh, profession. Um, if you have friends in Austin, well, let me show up. I can show you guys the. I'll share this in the chat with everybody. Um, no way you can go to no way on prop um, there are going to be, uh, there's more canvassing. There's people who are showing up at, uh, I'm putting these in the, ch in both chats. Uh, there for people who aren't familiar, basically what prop a is, is it's one of these, uh, kind of shadow grassroots, uh, you know, fake grassroots pushes to try to deal with the crime wave in Austin. And basically what it is, this is a front for the G GOP, um, you know, to try to basically wage war on the city council here because they can't win elections. Uh, so what they're trying to do is essentially force the city to hire an arbitrary amount of, of uh, police officers, despite the fact that Austin has spent more in the police department than it has in its history. Um, there's no real studies that show that increasing uh, police officers in the way that they're proposing uh, would do anything to, you know, uh, bring down violent crime here. Um, and it, what's even worse about it is that the way that it's written, the money would need to come from other services in the budget. And that means cuts to the fire department, cuts to the parks department and cuts to education services. Right. So this is a really um, this is an austerity bill through and through, even though they're trying to act like they're you know, trying to increase the amount of money the city is spending. They're actually trying to attack other very important uh, social programs here in Austin. And again, it's, it's pretty much run um, by the uh, by the Travis County GOP, despite the fact that they're trying to make it seem like it's a grassroots push. Um, but they're trying to hope that this upcoming election here is going to be a low turnout election uh, so that they can sort of rile up a few people on next door forums uh, to come and, 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 you know, attack the fire department budget and the parks department budget. Uh, so I put in a link uh, to some of the groups um, that are fighting it here in Austin. People who are in Austin can, uh, you know, sign up for canvassing, sign up for phone banking, et cetera. Uh, I'm going to be doing my first one later today. Um, enough just specifically about Austin and Texas. Let's hear what y'all are saying. Um, Mario has a question says open question. Um, any good sources? Says, oh, a good source. And I don't have any good sources on this, but on, on why a stock market finance pension system is a bad idea that also deals with common defenses for such a system. That's a tough question. I mean, because the, the fact is, is that, um, much like housing, there's this kind of push in the seventies to start trying to tie, you know, modest working class to, to middle-class wealth, um, to the health of, um, the richest people in the society's uh, profit margin, right? So that's why you start to see this shift towards, you know, pensions being very much tied to the success of the stock market, right? And it's a way to sort of buy people into the system who relative to the people at the very top of it, um, you know, have, have little, um, but it is all that they have um, is, is tied to the system. So it becomes a very, you know, they, they want the stock market to, you know, be, be successful. They want the government to intervene, you know, on behalf of, uh, you know, of the few and the powerful because they have a very, very small part of a uh, slice of that same pie, right? That's like a very, very like sneaky way that neoliberalism was really able to sort of metastasize um, in American society was tying people's kind of very, very modest uh, retirement funds uh, to uh, the much larger, um, system of, of of private profit and uh yeah i mean it's a it's it's it is a quite cynical move 
Yeah, and so we going back to the death penalty. You can even make arguments against the death penalty from a Christian conservative perspective. I agree with that. I mean, I was against the death penalty when I was a conservative myself too. Um, here we go. How bad do you think the evictions will get before we can push for vastly increased public housing? Well, I think that the the case right now for it is very strong, right? Um, we're already sort of living in that uh, <laughs> that situation, right? Um, I think the, the problem is that we have to have political movements that we can attach that demand to. I, for one, think that housing um, it really needs to be something that, that we start addressing um, on the left um, on, a, on a pretty systemic level, just because it is so it, it touches so many people and it touches people of all different levels of like the income bracket, frankly, um, you know, because this is something that, you know, if you're so, just sort of working and scraping by, you're facing the punishment of rent each each month. And if you're somebody who might have like a, you know, a kind of salary job, you know, you know you're not rich by any standards, but you're the kind of person who expects with the career that they have, they'd be able to buy a house. They're finding more and more that they can't afford anything in the cities that they live and work in. Um, I mean, this is something that has like much like Medicare for all did, um, has a, a broad range of, of support and is fundamentally, uh, you know, anti-capitalist in nature, right? Because it's directly attaching, uh, sorry, attacking um, the kind of, you know, neoliberal sanctity of, uh, you know, of, of, of private property. So I think that's something that we can address and, and start focusing on how, um, you know, we really have to build the movements that can start making and articulating that demand. Um, but, you know, from everything from affordability to, um, you know, to, to wages, et cetera, uh, housing is like what's on the other side of it, right? If you have low wages, you can't afford housing. Um, and now more and more, because our system is so designed to pump up uh, property values, uh, people who aren't in the market early enough are basically being priced out, right? So this is something that I think is ripe for opportunity, um, along with the fact that, uh, you know, we need to be building uh, green housing as a part of uh uh, of our fight against climate change. And, you know, people don't think about this as much. I mean, people talk a lot about meat eating, right? And I understand why the, the our agricultural system is absolutely um, horrific. Um, but, uh, you know, people talk, obviously people understand like, you know, emissions that come from, you know, transportation, you know, oil, gas industry, et cetera. Like people understand that as part of climate change. People will talk more and more about agriculture as a part of climate change, but the building trades are huge contributors um to uh you know the climate change as well so like starting to address that that industry at whole like this is the point is like housing touches on a lot of these different things and i think it's quite ripe uh for for doing for doing more on uh let me see Mario says uh, regarding pension funds and 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 workers, uh, they're asking because the next German government is planning to do the same thing over here now. Wow, I, I'm not too familiar with that. I'd be curious to learn more. Um, Sable says, did you hear about the billionaire bought um, bought Robert E. Lee statue from Big D Park and displays on a golf resort in uh, uh, La Juitas? <laughs> Thank you for your work and shows. I have not heard about that. <laughs> Let me see. Um, how do you feel about tenant unions and legislation against tenants to collectively bargain? I mean, tenant unions are, are, are a great way uh, to start getting involved in, in left-wing politics and left-wing movements. I, I mean, the, the, I think this is like a very ripe part of, of, of politics that we can be taking a lot of advantage of. Um, I, you know, I've always said if, if you're not able to, for example, like get directly involved in labor organizing, tenant organizing, especially if you live in a densely populated area, it's a great way to get, get into, you know, kind of like community organizing for sure. In a way that's not just, I don't know, that's of a little bit different, um, of a little bit different color than, uh, you know, just sort of general community organizing, because this is very like anti-capitalist in nature, right? Tenant organizing is uh, directly addressing the power of, of landlords and, and major uh, um, landholding corporations, right? I think it's a really direct way to sort of organize people on a, um, which side are you on dynamic? Um, all right, we got some more stuff in the, uh, the Twitch chat. Is DSA the most powerful left group not tied to the DNC? Um, I would say the DSA is, uh, <laughs> I mean, um, 
I, I would say the DSA is probably the, yeah the largest love group that's sort of not tied to that kind of NGO apparatus. Though there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to decouple it completely from it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't see any other kind of left organization, um, you know, with the same kind of potential as the DSA, other than you know organized labor in general. But like that, that there also needs to be a really significant severing of the the democratic party stranglehold over over labor unions as they exist today right um so yeah i would i don't know always curious about like the the context that you're bringing that up for but um for sure well why don't we talk about this um you know while we're talking about labor i wanted to um you know shout out <laughs> the continuing of these uh these labor struggles that we're seeing across the united states um and specifically, let me pull some things over. Um, where are these things? I have to use stupid Microsoft Edge because uh, Twitter now opens up your DMs whenever, <laughs> whenever you get on it, and I don't want anything to pop out. Um, I wanted to just sort of shout out, and I had meant to do it before. I'm going to put it in immediately after. Um, in the show notes on on YouTube, all of the different places that you can donate the strike funds, because this is really a critical moment. I mean, we talked with Maximilian Alvarez last week about this. Um, you know, there's been all this kind of like chest thumping about a general strike that you get from like the really particularly online left. And like, while I've always been really supportive of, of dreaming big, it's one of those things where you realize that there's a kind of detachment from reality, right? That you're thinking that you're the first person to come up with the idea that what we, what we need to do to like catalyze movement um, is to, you know, to have a massive labor um, disruption, uh, upsurge in labor militancy. It's like, well, no shit. This is what we all understand. The question is how, how to get there. Right. And some people think you're going to be able to get there, which is like kind of hashtags or sort of, you know, yelling enough on progressive media. But at the end of the day, what really has to happen is that people have to start standing up, um, for themselves and start building those, uh, those natural connections, those organic connections, um, instead of just sort of barking at people to, you know, to walk off, um, off the job, people need to start seeing it in their own class interest and th thinking of themselves as members of a, of a larger class as well, right? And, you know, this kind of uh, what we're calling Strike Tober movement has been a really exceptional um, and exciting development, I think, much more than any kind of like, I don't know, media campaign that some people were presenting. Um, so we want to take some time to highlight uh, what's going on there. But uh, oh, yeah. And in, in, in regards to that, this is a point that uh, I'm now relaying a little bit of a game of telephone. But, uh, you know, uh, Max was saying on our show last week that David Story was noting that, you know, what you really need to see um, is people showing up and opening up their wallets uh, to this fight. Uh, because these things, strikes are very hard to maintain. And if you want to talk big about something like a general strike in general, and we're not able to support um, the thousands of people, which is extremely significant, I'm not trying to downplay it at all, but it's much smaller, obviously, than a, you know, a nationwide organized general strike. If we're not able to, you know, uh, materially support people, uh, then we're nowhere near ready uh, for the kind of bigger things that some people are advocating uh, that, that we'd be doing, right? So this is a moment really to start trying to show up um for for people for people on strike and to build that consciousness and build that political movement that can sort of carry these uh natural labor struggles um into something even bigger and hopefully uh, political but um don't mean to talk uh too broadly about it. let's get specific for a second um i want to note uh first uh the kellogg um strike and and this is very similar to what we've been seeing um in uh <laughs> This is very similar to what we were seeing um, with the uh, UMWA um, and Warrior Met, right, where vehicles are being used uh, to try to break these strikes. So we have uh, here right now, let me share this with you all. Um, this is what's going on with the, uh, the Kellogg strike. Um, they will hurt somebody bad. Striking Kellogg's workers get hit by buses on picket line. Workers say buses carrying non-union workers scabs hit three workers in two hit three workers in two weeks. None seriously hurt, right? Um, and let's see if we can play this video here. You know, I'm not going to do that. Local media is the worst. Um, <laughs> With ads before videos. Let me just read this. Omaha police said officers have been called to the Omaha Kellogg's plant in the past two weeks several times for disturbances, blocking traffic, and even assaults. Kellogg's employees said the bus drivers 
um, bringing in workers to fill their jobs have hit several picketers. There's no beating on the buses, no damage on the buses, just trying to slow them down as they come in. Our right is the picket in front of them, which is absolutely correct, says uh, Chris Haynes. There's video of Haynes falling after a bus hit him at the plant. Haynes has been a Kellogg employee for 33 years. He said the bus driver intentionally hit him last week. They're coming out too fast, coming out onto a public street. They're not looking. Someone is going to get hurt uh, way worse. Um, than they already have, right? And it's already bad enough if people are getting hit um, on the picket line. Again, people have the right uh, to picket. Um, and there is, there's no reason this should be acceptable behavior. And this should be um, something that, fuck, this is one of those examples where we need stronger institutions that we have already, because this is something that should be prosecuted by the government against the company um, for directly threatening people's lives um, in, in, in this way. Uh, but we're seeing it more and more. And it's something that is particularly worrying, as you see across red states in the United States, um, this kind of push uh, to protect drivers from liability for hitting people who are protesting. Um, I mean, this is nothing other than, uh, you know, legalized assault on folks. Um, and, you know, hell yeah uh, to the striking uh, Kellogg workers who aren't going to back down for this shit. Hell yeah to all the striking workers across the country who are not going to back down because of this. But this is something that we really need to be uh, watching and highlighting and reminding people about that this isn't just the kind of like, I don't know, ideological dispute between you know two sides this is a, a side um, where people are fighting for their lives they're fighting for their livelihoods against corporations that are willing um to one try to starve people out um and two uh encourage people to use violence to break these strikes um somebody noted too i, I just wanted to highlight this from the chat as soon as says uh, strike funds uh aren't charity it's a war chest i absolutely agree with that um and someone else noted uh, in, in the Twitch chat, maybe it would be good for people to look into some historic examples of general strikes like the Seattle general strike and see what kind of organizations had to be in place to provide for people while shutting down capital. I think that's 100 percent right. Um, and the point is not to like I don't want people to ever mistake me saying be less radical. Um, but also, but what I am trying to say is like, understand what you're advocating for, um, and understand how to get what we want. Um, instead of just thinking sort of, you know, putting on a coat of radical slogans is the same thing as doing it. Um, and I think that sometimes we can get really carried away with a performative version of, of, of building workers power um, versus the actual more nuts and bolts aspect of that, um, as well. Um, Well, I apologize um, if I mispronounced your name. Um, and that's crazy about Florida, too. I mean, this is the thing. The uh, GOP legislatures across the country are just trying to legalize um, violence against, um, you know, protesters and, and, and strikers. Well, on this, I mean, there's a lot of strikes. I think, I'm, again, I'm going to put, I'm sorry, I should have put it in beforehand, um, but I will immediately after this. So come back once this is over um, into the uh, the show notes on YouTube. I'll put all these different strike funds that you can um, support. Um, I, I want to specifically note, um, too, that we not forget about our friends in Alabama. Um, the, the guys at Warrior Met are continuing in the strike. It's been going on for a very long time. And they have... Um, you know, they have, they have been unbelievably heroic. The community has really shown up, um, but they need our continued support. And that includes financial support uh, to maintain the strike um, in Alabama as well, right? I mean, these miners are still going. Um, and this is the kind of thing that we have to be able to build the capacity to be able to support people throughout all of this. Um, let me see. Because I want to highlight some of these other strikes and bring a kind of international way. And then maybe I'll take some more questions before uh, wrapping up here. Um, where did everything go? I don't know if these... Uh, I'm going to put into the uh, the YouTube chat. I, I don't have my Twitch open to do this right now. But just while we're here, um, I'm going to put in the strike fund um, where you can donate um, to the, the guys in Alabama. And then a little bit... Oh, sorry. Um, and a little bit later, I'm going to include uh, two different strike funds for the folks, uh, the Kellogg's workers as well, 
um, along with some things for the John Deere strikers. But I want to play a little bit of, of video here in a second um, from a more perfect union, um, because I think one, they've been doing really great work. Um, and, and two, I think that this video is really well done at sort of showing a, a kind of class consciousness, I think, um, is developing something that we can continue to you know, try to cultivate um, and also something that's worth celebrating. Um, so let me bring it up here. And this is from uh, More Perfect Union, which is a, has been doing a great job at covering all of the strikes um, lately. Um, but here we go. Let's see what happens. We put in hours, we make the product, and they are making billions of dollars on our back. All these people have been in there during the whole COVID pandemic, coming to work in their day, you know, potential of exposing themselves and their families uh, you know, to this, but they came in and worked anyway. Do I see your company you know, kind of recognizing that and trying to reciprocate this sort of way? No, I don't. John Deere is $6 billion a year. I've worked at John Deere for 19 years now. Uh, the reason why we're striking is, you know, 1997 is when uh, Deer divide and conquer. They made the two tier wage system uh, where you know, new hires coming in after the first of October 1997 uh, you know, got paid less wages, uh, didn't have health care after retirement, uh, pension, which is about a third of our predecessors. And, uh, you know, we've made, basically been taking concessions from that point for the last 25 years. They keep coming back for more. And uh, this is something that's really worth noting. I mean, because we have to understand not only the uphill struggle we have against, you know, companies like John Deere and Kellogg um, and Warrior Met, but also um, just how weak uh, we have been as, as a class movement for so long that we have had to accept things like these two tier systems. And, and that's something if you're not familiar with those, they are utilized across the country to try to break the power um, that labor has, I'm um, sorry, the, uh, to try to break the victories, to erode the victories that labor has won in the past. And they do that through divide and conquer strategy. So two tier system is when people who are brought in are not going to be protected with, have the same protections as other workers. They're not going to get the same kind of wages and benefits as other workers. And what do you think that that does on the shop floor, right? Does that build a spirit of like camaraderie? Um, of, of seeing yourself as, as people in the same strike, um, you know, fight. No, it creates animosity and resentment. Um, it, it creates a divided workforce and a workforce that is much easier um, to sort of be placated the people who are getting extra benefits um, versus the vast majority of other, other workers, right? Um, and this is a system that absolutely needs to be broken because it completely um, derails uh, the the whole concept of, of labor, uh, uh, of the labor movement, right? Which is supposed to say that united we are stronger than we are divided. Um, and it's very purposeful what it tries to do by creating that kind of splinter um, within shop floors. It also allows the company to sort of target certain workers and to take their benefits away first. Um, so by the time that they start coming for the, you know, the more organized union workers, right? Or the older hires, um, it's a little bit too late, uh, you know, to be able to muster up support. Um, for, for big labor action. Um, and the two-tier system is one version, um, but there have been many, many other of these kind of new formations of the way that we organize work um, that are meant to basically erode the victories of the past um, the past 100 years. And what we're starting to see is people starting to push back against that system. And um, they're starting to push back against kind of complacent um, union, uh, you know, union officials and start pushing for a more militant rank and file strategy. Um, these things are very, very encouraging. Um, we should note the the size is still, we're still wanting for more. Um, but this is, these are very encouraging developments. And it's just like understanding all of these dynamics, I think is going to be really, really uh, critical to making sure that this isn't just like a blip where we say, remember the, you know, the great fall upsurge of, of uh, you know, union militancy, labor militancy in 2021. Uh, we want this to be a catalyst moment. Um, and not just sort of, you know, a beautiful flash. Um, 
And John Deere, too, uh, is just unbelievably uh, a sickening corporation. Um, the, the amount of profit that they've been able to uh, to pull in over the past few years and the fact that it hasn't been shared uh, with the workers just shows how stacked the deck is against uh, working people, right? The whole idea that like these things, you know, once once the economy gets to a certain point or like once our profits get to a certain level, we're going to start, you know, sharing the wealth with all of y'all is bullshit. Uh, John Deere, the John Deere example completely blows that out of the water, as does the warrior mat, right? Um, example, right? These companies are never going to start sharing, uh, you know, their, their profits with working people, unless working people demand, um, and, and, and flex their muscles for better. It reminds me, um, and, and this is something that we have to start, um, you know, there, there are really important lessons that, that we have to learn, especially going into this period of time um that we're we're going into um when the talk is about inflation right because the things that we're hearing about for the most part when we're talking about the state of the u.s economy is that inflation is coming um and that supply chain interruptions are coming and maybe we'll do a longer uh long term like uh, a more in-depth version of, of talking about the supply chain interruptions um, but these two things are very much connected um with labor really being um, brought into the forefront of people's consciousness uh, when it comes to the system that we live under. I mean, for so long, especially under neoliberalism, this system was very, very good at obscuring and hiding labor. And folks right now are making sure that that's no longer the case. Um, I think a lot of people realize the power that they have had um, when they saw what happened during the, the pandemic. Um, and I think that that's a really encouraging sign. Um, but it also means that our opponents are very much preparing, um, for a backlash and don't forget, um, that government policy can be a great way, uh, to break labor militancy. Remember the rise of neoliberalism, starting with Carter, um, on to Reagan, um, was in response to a more and more militant American labor movement. Um, and they use both the, the federal government, uh, powers, they use the Federal Reserve's powers um, to break labor. And this kind of talk about inflation is, is something that we need to be very cautious of um, because they're going to start making the argument that workers' wage gains have gone too far, that working people are demanding too much. Um, and that means that, um, you know, we need to start tightening the belt. Um, that's, uh, of, of course, it's absolute bullshit, but that is the tactic that they will use. Um, they'll start out rhetorically, and then they will start out materially um, w striking back against these kind of gains that that, that we're seeing. Um, and I would just, a couple quick notes on that. I want to remind people that workers do not. Um, one, there is the, the kind of idea that wage gains necessarily need to be offset with price increases uh, is BS, right? That is the, that is a, that is something that comes out of a very specific kind of paradigm, right? And under that that, that paradigm is that, um, you know, c the profits of capitalists come first and foremost, um, that come are even more important than the functioning of the system. Workers do not set prices. Workers do not set prices. If you start seeing mass inflation, that means that bosses and owners are increasing uh, prices, um, which is a decision by them to benefit them to increase their profit share, right? Um, and and we need to be very, very clear about this kind of, of thing because they're going to present it as some kind of, oh, this is cold, calculated movements of the market, right? This is an ideological or political. This is just us looking at the books and, and deciding what we need to do based on, you know, science, facts, and reason. Um, no, this is a political decision, uh, you know, just sort of... Uh, to. to <laughs> This is a political decision to one um, on a mass scale start to make the argument that uh, you know improvements for workers come at the expense of you know a stable um, pricing system, um, and then on the uh, on the uh, you know on the on the kind of more smaller like micro level to make the argument uh, to workers that look if we have to increase our prices so much y'all won't have a job um, so you can't ask for much more because there's no more room. Um, it reminds me of something that happened with uh, the UAW, the UAW, I believe it was like the 40s or 50s. And there was a big, uh, a, a big strike um, against GM, I believe. And, and, and the workers were saying, 
Um, you know, and, and the company saying, if we if we uh, meet the contract that you're putting forward, if we meet the demands that you're making, we're going to have to increase prices on cars. Um, and the workers said, well, if that's the case, let us look at the books and let's see if we can find anything um, that we can cut, any things that we can be moving around um, so that this doesn't have to be the case. Because, you know, when if you work in an industry like that, you don't want your product to become unaffordable to people. You don't want their um, b because if it be, you know, because if it becomes unaffordable to people, that means that, um, you know, your industry is going to be hurt as a whole, right? So they're saying it's in our interest, uh, to try to find a way to make this work. Of course, the company did not open up their books, but that's the kind of thing, um, that we need to be sort of developing the capacity, um, and the demands for say, so, like, Hey, let us look at these books, John Deere. Hey, let us look at these books, uh, warrior Matt, um, you know, and, and see where all these profits are going and, and what we could be doing with them. Because I'll tell you what, um, <laughs> releasing more and more in that information is only going to make uh, these demands greater because people are going to see how much of the value that they're creating is being siphoned off to benefit a few. And if, yeah, of course, uh, supporting the right to repair is great practice. Well, I also wanted to continue the segment um, with two quick um, other things that are very encouraging as well. Um, this right here is talking about a reminder. It's a big part of the show. Um, it's a big part of the work on TMBS too. Um, remembering that like we can focus on you know local issues and like looking toward our communities to see where these fights are, but that this struggle is is global. And I thought that this was a really great um, clip. Um, in regards to the John Deere movement, um, we have here a show of international solidarity um, from friends in Brazil. Um, let's see if I can make this uh, larger. Hmm. I'm just going to play this real quick. Oh. Well, sorry about there. I guess there's no audio, but the audio is actually pretty uh, grating. There's a lot of wind in it because <laughs> um, it is in uh, Portuguese as well. Um, but. OK, yeah. Um, very, very, I mean, that, that's just something that you love to see. It's uh, beautiful to see that kind of international solidarity. People realize <laughs> that they're all in this fight together. Um, and even more importantly, that uh, um, Michael would have been very, very fucking happy to see something like that. Um, and staying on things that I think uh, would make uh, Michael happy and, and, and on Brazil, this is huge. And we'll definitely have to get... Um, some of our friends in Brazil on soon to talk about this more in depth. Um, but I don't know if people saw this earlier today. Um, there is some pretty big news here coming out of, uh, coming out of Brazil. And, you know, I think it's important to rem remind ourselves uh, that, you know, a lot of people who have now turned against Bolsonaro are doing so because he is massively unpopular. They were very willing um, to support a, a, a judicial coup against Lula. Um, but these developments are exciting nonetheless um, and, and hopefully mean that we'll be seeing um, Lula return to the presidency in the upcoming election. Um, but this is the kind of thing that uh, I, we need a hell of a lot more of 
on both in Brazil, but also in the United States. This is from the New York Times. Brazilian leaders' pandemic handling draws explosive allegation, homicide. A long-awaited report from a panel of Brazilian senators conclude that Jair Bolsonaro um, purposely let the coronavirus kill Brazilians in a failed bid for herd immunity. This is um, this is really huge. I mean, this is not just you know. I mean, people remember need to remember too um, that not only is this uh, going on, but it's been shown that Bolsonaro um, was using the vaccine. Uh, program or procure his his vaccine procurement pro program in Brazil um, as a huge um, essentially embezzlement scam um, as, as well. So he his uh, sink uh, sorry his ship is really sinking. Um, but this is the kind of thing that I think we need a lot more uh, of is, is politicians being responsible for the death and destruction that they um, that. <laughs> that they uh, they bring into society. Um, I'll, I'll read a couple paragraphs from this. A Brazilian congressional panel set up um, to recommend mass homicide charges against President Jair Bolsonaro, asserting that he intentionally let the coronavirus rip through the country and kill hundreds of thousands in a failed bid to achieve herd immunity and revive Latin America's largest economy. A report from the congressional panel's investigation, excerpts from which were reviewed by the New York Times ahead, ahead of its scheduled release, um, this week also recommends charges, um, criminal charges against 69 other people, including three of Mr. Bolsonaro's sons and numerous current and former government officials. It is at best uncertain whether the report from the 11 member panel, seven of them opponents of Mr. Bolsonaro, will lead to any actual criminal charges given the political realities of the country. But in deeply polarized Brazil, it reflects the deep uh, the depths of anger against a leader who refused to take the pandemic seriously. The report may prove a major escalation in the challenges confronting Mr. Bolsonaro, who took office in 2019, um, faces re-election next year, and is suffering um, falling popularity. Um, so, I mean, the, the fact is, is that, uh, again, as much as I think a lot of people are trying to sort of distance themselves from Bolsonaro, remember, I mean, the rich and powerful in Brazil, they always knew that, you know, Bolsonaro was a kind of clown fascist, but they were happy for him to be the form um, that their kind of opposition to very, very mild uh, progressive reforms in Brazil um, would take, right? He was the, he was the, <laughs> He was the the hammer that they were using um, to try to smash down, um, you know, a, a, a popular movements that were uplifting poor people in Brazil. Right? He might have not been their first choice, but they were happy to go along with it. Um, and what's happening now is his popularity is is sinking um, because I think he um, his 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 governance of the country has just been a, a a complete disaster, and not just a disaster in the way that like we care about which is like, you know, how what's happening to poor and working people in that society. It's been a disaster through and through for the vast majority of folks um, because he, he represents a kind of extreme eccentric uh, right wing, you know, pseudo populist uh, movement that just was not up to the task of dealing with a, uh, you know, a, a pandemic, let alone um, with the complexities of, of running a country like Brazil in the first place. Um, so again, remember, there's a lot of people who I think are going to try to wash their hands of Bolsonaro, but don't let your uh, you know attention turn away from them. Um, but this is an extremely huge development. No doubt about it. We love to see um, Bolsonaro um, <laughs> sweat a little bit, and maybe we can get a, a couple more hospital pictures of him before his tenure is over. Um, no, hell yeah, we got some f folks joining us. Um, I did not see where from, but welcome. We're sort of rolling up. I'm, I want to take some questions from uh, the chat in the uh, couple of minutes. Oh, we got our friends from uh, from uh, Left Flank Vets. Hell yeah. Um, well, let me take a couple of questions before I run. I, I have to uh, remind people who are just joining us, if you're in Austin, Texas, uh, try to get involved um, in the uh, No Way um, on Prop A uh, campaign. Uh, basically, a clandestine right-wing group is trying to uh, arbitrarily um, force the city into increasing the police budget um, and, and hiring more cops, something that we don't need in the first place. But on top of that, they want to do it in a way that is going to be at the expense of the fire department, the parks department, and the um, education systems here. Um, so if you are in Austin, Texas, uh, you know, trying to get involved and be sure to vote uh, no on Prop A. Um, but before I go, I'm happy to take a couple of... Uh, 
of questions from the chat. I'll, I'll look at both of them. And uh, yeah. Just... Um, and also remember, Matt and I are 80 people away from uh, from hitting our uh, 1,000 one thousand patrons um and i'd really like to hit that number because once we do that matt Leck is going to come visit me here in austin texas and i'm going to make a brisket and we're going to uh, do a barbecue stream uh, i'm really looking forward to that all right let's see um anyways um to get involved in stopping probably besides voting against it yeah go to this uh, website right there i just put in the twitch chat um it's a no way prop a.com um, and you can find places that you can volunteer, etc. cetera. Um, that would be, uh, um, very, very helpful. Um, all right, let's see if we got any questions before, um, we roll. Any thoughts on, uh, Andrew Yang's forward nonsense? I mean, no, I mean, as a political figure, Andrew Yang is sort of irrelevant now. I mean, he really messed up in, in New York. Uh, I think sort of showed the, the limits of his political vision. Andrew Yang. I think the thing about Yang that's tough is I think that there's a bit of him that's quite earnest. Um, but he definitely is not somebody who's going to be sort of guiding anyone out of this, uh, you know, political disaster that we're in right now. I thought like, I, for example, I think his UBI program was complete trash. Um, it was a clandestine way to sort of attack uh, social programs in the United States. I'm, I'm pretty ambivalent uh, around UBI. Um, I'm not necessarily against direct direct cash payments, um, but there's a reason that the, that sort of right wing libertarians um, do push ideas like UBI because basically, you know, if you need a floor to maintain a consumer base, um, you know, UBI is sort of a solution to that without sort of redistributing power. Again, I'm not against it on, on like you know, wholly, but I think that most of the ways that we would see UBI in our lifetime, or at least in the current kind of political setup, uh, would be as a way to sort of undermine um, not only social programs, um, but to also sort of put to bed the labor question. Um, but um, beyond that, I mean, his political party, I think it's just going to be a joke. I think the big thing with Yang is that he ran for president and then he ran for mayor. I think Yang sort of liked campaigning and sort of like engaging with people in, in that way. I think it's probably more fun for somebody like Yang to sort of have no consequences um, or no real responsibility when it comes to these these things. So, you know, creating his his new um, third party is a way for him to sort of, I don't know, keep doing the uh, political circuit forever. Right. Um, I don't think he has any intentions in sort of returning back to being a private citizen. Um, and he, but he also has no opportunity to become, uh, you know, an actually elected politician. So starting a, a joke third party and sort of keeping the taps on, on the fundraising apparatus that he did build up in his, his presidential campaign and then in his mayoral um, campaign as well. I mean, this is a perfect way to do it. I don't know, man. It's sad. I like the thing that pisses me off about Yang is that like, I, I see some people who get brought into his stuff um from a genuine place of sort of you know being f somewhat anti-capitalist you know realizing the systems are rigged against them but it's only because of i think the 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 dramatic pessimism that most people are feeling um that like it's easier to sort of coalesce around kind of yangism which is an incoherent ideology um but at least sort of you know makes it seem like oh this is some kind of technical fix that no one has ever thought of before um versus a more structural uh critique it makes me a little sad um i guess um but i don't know man it's sort of a goofy goofy guy at this point um is a uh, is a uh, yang more successful than than beto i mean i don't know i, I would imagine yang probably uh, raised more money though i'd be curious um, I'd be very curious, uh, to see if that's the case or not. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, and also Andrew Yang's, um, company venture for America was a real disaster too. And I think that that should give people a little bit of pause about him. Um, well, let's see, I'm happy to take any more, uh, a couple more questions before our roll. Um, so let me scan. My brother was a Yang Bernie guy, but also listened to Sam Harris. I mean, that's the thing. 
everybody's sort of wild like that. Um, favorite taco toppings? I don't know. I'm a salsa person. I mean, uh, if I'm at a Tex-Mex place, I like, you know, a little shred cheese or something like that. But I usually like to keep it. I mean, if I'm having like Mexican or like, you know, Donald style tacos, I'm definitely going to keep it simple with, you know, onions and salsa typically. Um, let me see. And I think Yang was also a way for people to sort of have a alternative politics that wasn't radical, right? So that's why you saw kind of a lot of wealthier celebrities getting into him. Um, all right, let's see. Let's see. You know, I don't watch enough basketball to make any NBA predictions, but I do like the San Antonio Spurs. Matt Leck would be better to talk basketball than me. I do. I watched a lot of football, not too much basketball. <laughs> Does Matt Leck smell nice? I don't know. You might have to ask Sam. I think Sam smells it more often than I do, right? <laughs> uh, Matt has a very, very professional hygiene uh, routine. Uh, Mario says uh, the OECD released a study saying that the wealth of Western nations is going to decrease because we are over age and that will hinder economic growth. Any comments, David? Um, you know, I think that the, when it comes to, there is a kind of, you know, demographic history in, in capitalism that like aging populations can be difficult, um, you know, or just not going to be as vibrant, um, as uh you know younger populations um you can see that in, in in countries like like japan right and then also when you have more and more i mean don't even think about it from like the level of like politics in the terms of like social security but just think about it like i don't know it's a technical question if you have a lot of older folks and there's a lot more burden on the next generation to just like be doing the actual material work of, of supporting them um some people when uh on, on the left, because I think there's a lot of people in the U.S. left who are sort of like against having kids. And I can understand on a personal level why people might not be it, like having kids is f fucking hell um, in, in the system. I mean, it's a, a huge driver um, in, in poverty because we don't as a society provide for, for children. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, we should take things like, you know, falling birth rates, people saying that they don't want to have kids as a kind of indictment for the society that we're living in. People make the argument, for example, that why it's not a problem that the United States um, can, uh, you know, can maintain like a low birth rate and, you know, maintain its like hegemony, um, you know, its economic powerhouse is through immigration. And I am of the opinion that we should be inviting any and all who want to come into the United States. We have the, the resources to do it. Um, but I would say on a moral level, the reason people come to the United States, like as much as I would like to think it's because, you know, <laughs> you know, be all patriotic and say it's because they like our, our culture and our food and et cetera. The reason people come to the United States is because we have all the resources. And the reason we have all the resources is because we maintain a hor horrific system of imperialism and forced, um, you know, um, plundering of, of the rest of the globe, right? One through, through our historical kind of occupations, um, and, and, and military engagements around the globe. And now um, through a financial system that basically recycles all of the, the profits from the rest of the globe into the United States. And when you have a free flow of capital going one direction into a society, you very soon after that are going to see large groups of people following that, that money, right? Um, so again, I'm all for um, larger rates of, of immigration in the United States, but we should also realize that the reason that that happens um, is because of, of our imperial system. Um, so when it comes to, and I, I bring that up, I mean, uh, you know, that, that obviously opens up a whole host of, of, of issues and, and, and questions, but I bring that up in return, in, in, uh, regards of like an aging population in the United States that I don't find that argument right, that we can just maintain like a system of like hyper migration into the United States um, as a solution to that problem um, to be that convincing just because of what it requires.
to maintain that system, right? It basically requires the United States um, to, to continue functioning as a Hoover vac, sucking up value um, and, and just sort of holding it uh, behind, <laughs> behind our imperial walls in the United States, right? I don't think that's a very just system. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, those are the things with demographic changes is like, those are things that are, uh, very difficult to, to sort of address quickly. Um, I also would say, you know, be worried though, even though that I, I think that like, there's something there to, to pay attention to the right wing is certainly using this as a boogeyman. Um, no doubt about that. Um, when are we going to get some left reckoning NFTs? <laughs> Ask Matt that. Um, yeah, that could be fun. Y'all can we can do some NFTs of uh, us making brisket. Um, and Mario says, uh, in response to that question, I just answered. The big takeaway should be that instead of saying we have to grow, we should start asking why does the economy ha have to continue to grow constantly? I mean, too, I think the question is like, why are we growing in the directions that we're growing? Because when you look at like, I'm I'm not one of these kind of like uh, degrowth people. Um, I think that like addressing the growth mechanism in capitalism, I mean, is, is one of the fundamental flaws of the system, right? And it's not something that I'm not saying don't critique that. Um, but when we talk about, doing the things that we want to do both um, for fighting climate change and for providing for people. I mean, you got to remember that there is like not only in the United States, um, there is still serious poverty, um, but globally there's still serious po uh, poverty and, you know, like lack of access to food and shit like that. We're not even talking about the, the baubles of society. Um, we want to be growing in a way that can provide for people and we want to be growing in a sustainable way, but to act like, um, you know, we can just sort of sit on what we're producing right now, um, I think would be wrong. We, there are whole new avenues of things that we need to be providing um, for people. So the question is not necessarily, I think you can focus too much on the growth mechanism and and forget on the, the power question, right? I'm just asking, why does our economy have to grow and why is it growing in a, in a direction that only benefits certain groups? Or, or like, why is it growing in certain industries? Right, those are the kind of, of ways that you need to start thinking about these things. Um, and yeah, and I, I don't think I'm be able to pronounce the name here. Um, but, uh, there is that tool it says us capitalism doesn't even grow industrially. It grows in strictly financialized terms and rent seeking. Right. And that's like, I mean, did y'all see the fucking, the pizza, the, the, the pizza scam, the financing for pizza that's coming up. I can't remember the name of the company, but it's one of these things like a firm, which is, you know, when you start seeing all these kind of financialized uh, products developing in the United States, you can see that the profit system um, is bro is is really really broken. Uh, people should read Aaron uh, Beninoff's uh, uh, book on this as well, right? Um, but when you see all these kind of financial in instruments sort of being developed and these financial products being pushed on us, like a product that literally is helping you pay for pizza, right? So this is a <laughs> a company that allows you to sort of like split up your payments for your Grubhub order, right? um you know over a period of time and obviously you know they they charge you interest and that's how they make their money when you start seeing shit like that just like finance trying to sit itself on top of like already existing um activity right like ordering pizza once a week or something like that um you're seeing one um people in like the consumer society like american working people getting food is something that's becoming unaffordable um, but also you're seeing in the financial world that it's harder and harder for them to turn profits so they're getting into more and more extreme and absurd um, already existing activities they're trying to find a way to attach themselves to already existing activities um, in, in more and more and absurd ways i mean that means that there's a lot of fundamental rot in the system um, not just moral <laughs> like economic um so yeah. And so when we talk about growth, right, that's the kind of growth that we're seeing in the United States. Um, and that's something that we should definitely be opposing. And I'm all happy for degrowth of financial bullshit like that. Um, but I also just think that, like, you know, we shouldn't take an austerity mindset uh, to sort of eradicate poverty either. All right. Griscoin will be the best, uh, the best, uh, the best crypto. I like that Griscoin. Um, uh, 
All right, y'all. I think uh, I think I'm gonna roll um, again. If you are in Austin, um, try to uh, get involved with uh, with vote no on Prop A. Um, I'm also going to be putting in to the chat uh, on our Twitch. We need to make sure that we're supporting our friends who are on strike. Um, so I'm going to try to put this in the Twitch chat really quick. Um, I'm going to be putting in the uh, YouTube description of this video in just a moment um, about four or five different strike funds that people can donate to. It'd be really wonderful if you can. Um, I also want people to remember to you know continue supporting the, the miners in Alabama. Um, as as I was quoting a, a quote that uh, Max said, a point that uh, David's story made uh, on the conversation with him is like, you know, people want to talk about all this big stuff um, that we want to do, but if we we need to be able to materially support people um, going on strike uh, right now, I mean, this is first and foremost just trying to build up and utilize the networks that we've been building. So uh, try to get involved if you can, and I will see you all tomorrow. Uh, Matt Leck will be with me as always, and we'll be joined by uh, Branko Markadic, um, who's going to be talking about Joe Biden, um, who he is, what he believes, and whether or not he is the next FDR. Um, don't want to poison the well, but I'm pretty sure y'all can tell uh, where we land on that. And again, if you're able to, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash left reckoning. We've been growing a lot. It's been meaning so much to Matt and I. The real hope soon um, is that once we're able to hit a few more of these these growth goals that we can sort of expand the team a little bit and also to start making this project a little bit more mobile um so you know definitely continuing to do the streams and the shows uh, but also being able to sort of fund people to maybe go up um you know and, and cover these strikes and these big moments on the ground um instead of sort of just uh you know getting them second hand uh, so if you've liked what matt and i have been doing for all these years I um, mean, you'd like to see this sort of expand into like a more full-fledged media operation, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash left reckoning. Um, I appreciate all of y'all and I will see you tomorrow.